reader, I'm Cindy Burnett. Welcome to my award-winning podcast, Thoughts from a Page, which is a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. On the show, I chat with authors whose books I have enjoyed about their new releases, and I give you a peek behind the curtain of the publishing industry with my Behind the Scenes series. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. If you're looking for a community of readers, bonus content, and a chance to read books before they hit the shelves, I hope you'll consider joining my Patreon group, which is filled with a wonderful bunch of book lovers. The link to join is in the show notes. Do you love to be in the know about upcoming books? Kelly Hooker of At Kelly Hook Reads Books and I do too. We couldn't find a comprehensive list of titles all in one place, so we made one ourselves, and now we're sharing it with you. Our literary lookbook is a list of 182 books releasing from January to May 2024, curated for our communities. The link to buy it is in my show notes. Today, I am chatting with Tess Garrison about The Spy Coast. International bestselling author Tess Garrison took an unusual route to a writing career. A Stanford University graduate, Tess went on to gain her MD at the University of California, San Francisco. While on maternity leave as a physician, she began to write fiction. She published her first novel in 1987 and has since sold over 40 million copies of books in 40 countries, winning the Nero Wolf Award and the Rita Award. Her series, featuring homicide detective Jane Rizzoli and medical examiner Mara Isles, inspired the TNT television series Rizzoli and Isles, starring Angie Harmon and Sasha Alexander. Now retired from medicine, she lives in Maine and writes full-time. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks, AG1, for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Tess. How are you today? I'm doing great. Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you too. And I loved the Spy Coast, so I'm really thrilled to pieces that you're here to chat with me about it. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm looking forward to talking about it. I really enjoyed the premise, and I can't wait to ask you a ton of questions about it. But before we do that, would you give me a quick synopsis of The Spy Coast for those that haven't read it yet? Yes. It's about a woman named Maggie Bird, who is in her 60s, lives a quiet life in Maine as a chicken farmer, but she never talks about her past. Uh, It turns out she is a retired spy trying to hide out, but her past comes knocking at her door and she has to turn to her friends who are also retired spies to help her track down somebody who's trying to kill her. And how did you settle on the premise for this one? Well, it has to do with where I live. It just so happens that I live in a small town in Maine uh, where we do have a lot of retired spies living here. Uh, It's something I discovered three decades ago when I first moved here. And it always intrigued me that these these gray-haired people that I would run into at the grocery store um, had interesting pasts past lives that they can't talk about. So I wondered, what do retired spies do? Do they get together for, for book clubs? Do they uh, have martinis together? And that, that's where it all came from. It's, it's like, what do you do when you're retired? You still have these skills and maybe you miss the old life. Why do you think they congregate in Maine? That's a good question. I've heard several explanations. One realtor told us that <laughs> apparently they have some sort of a retirement a uh, magazine and uh, somebody had said it's a great place. And so they started jump- showing up here. <laughs> I think that part of it is that people here respect your privacy. Uh, Mainers do not delve too deeply into people who, uh, who don't want to be, who don't want to answer questions. It's far from any nuclear attack zone. 
It's beautiful. And the CIA does have a history up here. Certainly during um, the, the 60s and 70s, this was a place for safe houses. It was also a place where they conducted some experiments with psychedelics. So yeah, there there is a familiarity up here for uh, a lot of CIA. That's just so fascinating to me. It is. It's it's so funny to me too because um, I I discovered after I learned about their presence here, I realized that in my very short street that I was living on at the time, uh, I had a spy to the left of me and a spy to the right of me. So there they are. When you rub shoulders with them without realizing it, I would always be trying to ask them questions to see if I could sniff anything out. Yeah, they don't talk too much. I mean, they will. <laughs> they will say. <laughs> Well, they will say, I used to work for the government, but I can't talk about it. And uh, that's the, that's about as far as you'll get, unless you're down to the next generation and their kids will sometimes talk about it. I, sometimes I find out so-and-so's dad um, you know, was killed in Africa. Why? Um, and then you find out that, yeah, they were working for the government. And you decided to make this a series, correct? It happened probably as I was finishing up the book and thought, I am really sorry to leave these people behind. They're fun to work with. And I also was quite taken with a character who is not a spy, who is the local police chief, a gung-ho young woman. And I wanted to know what happens to her next as well. So I think that's where most series arise from. You're writing about people. You love these people. You come to love these people. And you don't want to let them go. And so when you're writing the first book that you decide will be a series, do you approach it a little differently, knowing that you want to continue with these characters and you don't want to box yourself in in any way? Well, when I first started it, I didn't, I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't approach it that way. I thought it was going to be a one-off and I would go back to writing was only an Isles. Right. But there was, I think there was something about the setting because it's my home state that feels so familiar and so comfortable for me. And there's something about the age group of these characters. Now, <laughs> you know, I'm no spring chicken. I'm get, I'm, I'm their ages, their ages. And I, I wanted to write about people like me, uh, people in their sixties and seventies and eighties who aren't, we're, we're not used up yet. Um, we still have a lot of skills and maybe it's time that we get to be the stars of the show. So uh, that was the other thing that kept me wanting to continue with these people. So after you decided that, did you go back with fresh eyes and think, okay, I need to go back through this manuscript, through my draft, see if I've done anything that I need to change because it will be a series or do you just figure, okay, I'm going to go with it? It helped direct me to maybe bringing Joe Thibodeau, my cop, uh, more more to the forefront, giving me more of a, a sense of her background because she does. She's one of the major pillars of of this series. She represents Maine. She represents people who've been here for generations who look at outsiders with a little bit of suspicion. And I wanted to show just what it is like to be to be a Mainer and and to feel like your little town has been invaded by people you don't understand. So I did go back and enrich her a little bit, give her some background, you know, talk about her father and her multiple generations who have lived in this town. What else did I do? I, I think what I may have changed is I went back and I, I enriched some of the, the, the other characters in the Martini Club, gave you some more ideas of, of what it is they eat when they get together and what books do they discuss, because they became more full-fledged to me as I finished the book. I loved Jo, and one of my questions for you was going to be if anybody inspired her. Well, you know what? We do have a lot of women cops up here and they are very, I I like to think of them as solid, um, matter of fact people uh, who know their communities. And that, I think that's the inspiration for me is just, is just local people who know their communities well, know what goes on behind the closed doors of some houses. Know, they know the backgrounds of everybody. They went to high school and elementary school with them. So they've, They've seen the history of maybe the bad people and have have watched them develop since elementary school into the criminals they are. Know who to keep an eye on and who who not to worry about. Right. I mean, that's that that's the heart of community policing, isn't it? It's just know your community. Absolutely. Well, what kind of research did you do? Well, because my book is not so focused on spy craft and on the nitty gritty of what it's like to be a. a, uh, Non, under non-official cover, I focus more on the emotional aspects, on what is it like to live a life where you can't tell the truth, where every friend you make, there's a, there's a secondary gain involved. And for that, I think the best way to approach is it is to go through memoirs. So I read about five memoirs of, uh, of CIA agents. 
what it was it like for them to get into the the agency to train um, and what was their li- what were their lives like abroad and that that helped a lot just getting into their you know into their heads seeing the world in a different way also I wanted to to delve into the the personal aspect of it the you know the deeply emotional part of getting married how do you get married you know who do you marry can you trust your spouse what is it like um, not being able to be completely upfront with them so that I think that's what the book most mostly focused on it's it's the it's the psychological strain and stress of working in this kind of field and then what it would be like when you were done when you retire and your life is so much more quiet and stayed and how you adjust to that yes and and that in a way I you know I have sort of witnessed you know among my neighbors and the people I know are retired agency people they never stop engaging in the world um, in fact, my little town has a number of very well regarded international conferences that, and people come from around the world, experts come from around the world to talk about world affairs. Well, how did that happen that this little town manages to, to attract these people? It's because the retired CIA and retired State Department people who live here have never stopped looking outward. So that, that's how they stay engaged. They know a lot, they talk to each other, and they want to be involved in, in the future of the country. Absolutely. Well, what surprised you the most when writing this one? I think I was surprised mostly by how emotionally spent I felt about two thirds of the way through the book when when there was a major event in the story that affects Maggie and the rest of her life. And I think I was surprised that I started crying. I mean, I, mean, I don't usually do that when I'm writing a book, but this this particular point in the book, and if you when people read it, they'll know what I'm talking about, was quite a shock to me. That's so interesting. Do you plot or do you pants? I pants. I completely pants. So I can tell you that when I started off, I just had these, this, you know, vague idea of who these people were. All I knew was I heard Maggie's voice in my head that um, she, she has a past that's a very sor- sorrowful past. Um, she still feels guilty. She still feels grief. And she's dealing with that. But I didn't know who these other people were. And I think that with every chapter, uh, when I would open up another bit of her flashback into her, her work abroad, you start to see what, you know, what the tragedy is in her life and how it builds up to that point. And, and you start to feel for her because you, you feel like you too are falling in love. That's so interesting. So you just sit down and write and then go where it takes you and then have an emotional moment when you feel you've reached this point and you know how heartbreaking it is. Yes, yes. That, and I think that's the best part of being a pantser is that you're taken by surprise all the time by what your characters do or about the, how the story turns on you. It is a hard way to write a book. I don't recommend it. I think it causes a lot of, of angst for me because I spend a lot of time tearing up pages and writing myself into blind alleys. Um, but another pantser told me that it's when you're trapped in that blind alley and you don't know how to get out that the surprises happen. I think that whatever works for you is what you should do. And I think the amount of time spent is going to be the same. It's just a matter of where it is, you know? So if that's what works for you, then you should just definitely keep doing it. Yes. What works for me is that I, um, I just see where the characters take me. I can see ahead maybe a couple of chapters. And of course, you know, at the end, you're going to have some sort of a happy ending. But the part between A and Z is a little hazy for me. And I think the fun part is is getting the surprise, surprising uh, piece of dialogue that you weren't expecting. And that twists the story in a different direction. Um, So I think that, yeah, surprising yourself is surprising your readers as well. I just love that because I don't think I could ever do that. I mean, I'm not a writer either way, so it's not like I'm plotting versus pantsing. But just sitting down and trying to just write, I find that so incredible. And you know, it's not easy. It's, it's never been easy. And in fact, I'm upstairs now working on the second draft of the next book. It is, um, you know, I feel like banging my head against the desk all the time. And uh, that's, that's the downside of pantsing. I wish I could do an outline. I wish I could just sit down and write it, you know, everything that happens. Whenever I've tried to do that, I've always veered away from it. And the outline ends up going into the trash. I gave up on that. And I also think that if I were to follow an outline strictly, I would be bored um, because I would already know what happens. The fun part of writing a book is you don't know what happens. Exactly. And that works for you. Yeah, it works for me. And, you know, and I like to tell writing students that there is no right or wrong way to write a book. 
if it turns out that you do really well with synopses, then that's the way you should do it. Give yourself permission to write in a messy way. Give yourself permission to write badly uh, because you can always fix things. And that's, that's the other thing I, I, you know, that gives me some comfort. I can always fix things. Exactly. Just get it down on the page and then there's plenty of time to edit. Yes, right. And, you know, editing is a big deal for me because because my first drafts are such a mess. <laughs> so I, I do end up doing, you know, six, seven drafts before I'm happy with the story. Well, what would you say the highlight of writing this book was? I think the highlight of it was being able to write about the places, all the places, the wonderful places around the world that I've been to and to write about Maine as well. I've lived here for 33 years and I've been, that means 33 winters. Uh, and it's and it's fun to write about a different season than you happen to be sitting in at the moment. Um, I find that I can write about winter more easily than in, in the summertime um, than when I'm actually in the middle of it. So being able to describe living in, in the cold and, 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 and farming and chickens. Uh, my, my son raised chickens, so I do know something about raising chickens. And, and being able to, to, I guess, tell you how much I love this place. Um, I don't think I could have written about Maine if I had not lived here all these all these years. But then there are also the other places that show up in the story, Bangkok, Istanbul, London, all places that I've spent time in, uh, particularly Istanbul. That is one of my favorite places. And it was it was great to be able to write about it. That's interesting. I didn't realize you chose those cities based on places you had visited and really liked. Yeah, they're places that I feel I know pretty well. So I, I could I could tell you what it smells like. I can tell you what uh, what I would eat if I were on the streets of Istanbul. And there is a lot of food involved in this in this book because I think that people who've lived abroad for a long time, people who've worked abroad, are probably pretty adventurous eaters as well. They have to be. Um, so I like to I like to bring that into the story. I always think it brings the culture alive when you can talk about food and the smells and the architecture, all of it. You just feel like you're there as well. Yeah, uh, and and that would be one of the attractions of working abroad, of uh, working for the CIA or the State Department, is that you do get to experience that firsthand. Now, Maggie is not only just living abroad; unfortunately, she has to use people who are abroad, and and that was um, that was the other aspect of her life. She's she's developing assets, people that um, she knows she has to use, people whose lives she's putting into danger. Does she like them? Does she feel guilty? And, and and indeed, when one of them does get killed, she you know she's a little shaken by that. That would be the hardest part of that job, I think. Yeah, because you're using people, and that's your job. Your your job is to use people. However, you manage to inveigle them into it, whether it's through money or through friendship, um, you are aware that this person is putting themselves at risk. Well, and I'm a terrible liar too, so I would never be able to be hiding behind that kind of identity. Everybody would know that I was an agent the second they saw me. Well, you know, that, that is so true for a lot of people. You, you wonder what, what kind of a personality lies so easily, <laughs> you know, can, can do this kind of uh, you know, covert work. It, it takes a special personality. And I think Maggie's past of, of living with a father who never told the truth probably helps her. Absolutely. Well, tell me about the title and the cover. Okay, the title is The Spy Coast. The cover is unlike any cover I've ever had. It is more of a graphic kind of cover with just the title, The Spy Coast, and snow and, and winter trees. That's, that is it. To me, it felt a little more like a, you know, a literary Jean Le Carré cover. Uh, no faces, no people, just footprints in the snow. And I loved it. I love it too. I'm a huge cover person. And I just felt like it really stood out. And once I read the book, it ties in so well. And then how did you settle on the Spy Coast for the title? Well, you know, I went through several, several iterations. Um, I used to, my first working title was Spyville because it takes place in a little town in Maine. And then nobody liked it. <laughs> my agent, my editors, they all said, nah, it can't be Spyville. Um, so we tried Spy Town. No, they didn't like that either. And it was my editor, uh, Grace Doyle, who her team said the Spy Coast. So, um, and that and that felt it felt good. It felt bigger. I think it felt like a bigger book. I really like the Spy Coast because it just makes you envision this group of spies all hanging out together in Maine. Yeah, and it is on the coast. I mean, I live on the coast, and 
it does give you more of a sense of place as, as opposed to spy town. I mean, that could be, that could be anywhere that could be Detroit, but the spy coast, you could, you do get a sense of outdoorsy, the ocean, the Rocky coastline. And yep, that's where they hang out. You mentioned earlier that you were happy to write about a group of people that were your age. And I love that we are having this boom in authors tackling that. It's so nice to not just have everybody be in their 20s and 30s. It's just delightful, I think. Yeah. And what I love about it is that they're not all gorgeous people. I mean, that's unfortunately, American television kind of plays into that thing where you have to be good looking to be on TV or you have to be good looking to be a hero. And, you know, real heroes, yeah, they're 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 not necessarily good looking. In fact, the the best spies are the ones you don't even notice, the ones that pass, you know, by anonymously because they look so unassuming. And that that is what my characters have become as they become silver haired and, and, and older. I think it's also nice that they are ordinary people. They they do have real lives. You know, they one of them um tends his garden. Um, another one is on the library board of the local village. And then my heroine is a, she's a chicken farmer. They have ordinary lives because they've left those exciting lives behind, or have they? Exactly. And they have their martini club and they meet and have dinner and talk books. Yes, they talk books and they talk um, exotic foods and they bring recipes from around the world because that's where they've lived. I just love that. Well, speaking of books, before we wrap up, Tess, what have you read recently that you really liked? Um, yeah, I, I have. Okay. Um, I don't know whether this book, when this book is coming out, but I just read The Galley. I suppose I can talk about galleys. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a new author. Um, it was kind of a deliciously fun book called Knife Skills for Beginners. And it's written by a professional chef. <laughs> so um, he talks a lot. It's a, it's a murder mystery uh, that takes place in a cooking school in London. And his, uh, it's called Knife Skills for Beginners by Orlando Murin, M-U-R-R-I-N. And what I loved about it was that there's a lot about cooking in here, about what is it like to be a chef and about the ways that professional chefs look at food preparation, as opposed to the rest of us who are just amateurs. There's another book that I, I have been talking about lately that has been out for a while. It's called Trailed by Catherine Miles. It's a true crime book about murders in the Shenandoah Park. And it's about how dangerous it really is for women backpackers in the wilderness, in our state parks, in our national parks. There's crime that goes on there that we don't hear about. We think of the woods as being a safe place. Um, but it turns out for if you're a woman hiking alone, it is not necessarily true. And then there's a new book that I just received that I actually haven't cracked open yet, but I've read a lot about and I can't wait to read it. It's called The Deadly Rise of Anti-Science a scientist's warning by Peter Hotez, who's a vaccine scientist. And it's something that, uh, as a medical doctor, I'm very alarmed by is the rise of anti-vaccine uh, rhetoric and anti-science in general, whether, whether it's global climate change to, to medicine. All three of those sound fabulous. I've heard of the middle one, but I haven't heard of the, either of the other two. So thank you so much. I'm adding them all to my list. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Tess. I know we're going to follow this up with a spoiler-filled conversation for my Patreon community, but I really appreciate your taking the time to come on my main show. Well, I, I've had a good time. Thank you for all the really great questions. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not. It's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily. You might be surprised to know that not all serial killers are straight, cisgender white men. And the victims of true crime are not a monolith either. She's Wendy and I'm Beth. And together we host Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color, a true crime podcast. Together we take deep dives into the true crime stories about marginalized and minoritized perps and victims that often go untold. We also provide the context and nuance that these stories deserve. At Fruit Loops, we're serving up true crime with a side of history, society, culture, and some fun. Listen to Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.
Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I would love to connect with you on Instagram or Facebook, where you can find me at Thoughts from a Page. If you enjoy the show, please consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. If you have a moment to rate the show or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts, I would really appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And please tell all of your friends about Thoughts from a Page. Word of mouth does wonders to help the show grow. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. I'm Allison Holland, host of the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Equipped with a microphone and a long-term fascination of the Kennedy family, I am joined by an incredible cast of experts, friends, and guests to take you on a fun, relaxed, yet informative journey through history and pop culture. From book references to fashion to philanthropy to our modern expectations of the presidency itself, you'll see that there is so much more to Kennedy than just JFK or conspiracy theories. Join me for the Kennedy Dynasty podcast.